Call the meeting to order. All right, Tom Tester. Here. Uh, Scott Woolwick. Here. Roger Lang. Here. Renee Davis. Here. Dan Wolford. Here. Ken Houston. Here. Wes Lowry. Here. Kevin Bowden. Here. Hope Bartlett. Here. Alex Merkline. Here. Chris Huffer. Here. Um, Bryce Hadley. Here. Miles Churchill. Here. And Chelsea, what's your last name? Wilson. All right. Chelsea Wilson. And Heather McIntyre is here. I don't see Council Member Martin yet, but chair the other forum. Okay. Thank you. That's approved previous month's minutes. Anybody have any questions or comments about last month's minutes? I have a motion to approve. So Second. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Um, Kevin, you give us a status of the water? Sure. Um, flow at the St. Rain this morning at Lions Gauge was 19.7 uh, CFS, the 125 year historic average is approximately 14.5 CFS for this day. Um, the call on the St. Rain this morning was uh, Rockin' Creek Ranch. I can't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> Which has a priority date of 12-19-2001. Uh, and the number of 55505. Five, so way down there. So anyway. um, currently there are no calls on the South Platte. Uh, Ralph Price Reservoir Front Notch Preserve is at an elevation of 6389.5, which is approximately 10 and a half feet down, um, or 13,977 acre feet. Um, this is about 2,200 acre feet per fall. Union Reservoir is currently at a gauge height of 23.8 or 9,873 acre feet, which is down approximately 2,895 acre feet from fall. Uh, select St. Rain Drink Basin Storage Reservoirs at the end of December were at 75% of full. This time last year, the St. Rain Basin Reservoirs were at 69% full. So we're doing a little bit better than last year. Um, uh, in terms of snowpack level, uh, the Colorado River headwaters is currently at 95% of average. Uh, and the St. Rain right now is at 81% average. Mm -hmm. So we'll take it, it took a little bit of dip on the uh, uh, same grain, but hopefully we can make that up in the next couple of weeks. Questions for Kevin? That's cool. Let's call it the basement It's empty. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. It's a short I'm assuming it was for maintenance purposes. Yeah. yeah. We have a. Uh, a hole in the bottom of the spillway tube in the outlet, and we had to bring it all the way down. Basically, we had to pull it all the way down to the bottom, and we're currently working on a fix for that. So, hopefully, within the next couple of months, we'll get it repaired and get the water back in. Yeah, it says it has to be like three weeks or whatever. Yeah, I've had a few calls. Okay. Okay. Any point you might be heard? Um, I just wanted to note um, we received uh, the annual sustainability and climate action report just for board's information. I'll pass that out at the end of the meeting and then if the board actually wants a uh, presentation by the sustainability group, you can let us know and we'll ask by to a future meeting. I just want to put on the record that I'll hand out that report at the end of the meeting. Anything else? That's all I have. Wes? No development? Not this one. Okay. <clears throat> all right. I have from the staff. Can you even talk about more? Colorado yeah, I wanted to, uh, I've got a quick PowerPoint here for you to take a look at. Um, two things um, going on the lower Colorado River. The first is um, we attended the um, City Council's retreat. They had asked for a presentation on the Colorado River and what its potential impacts might be on long west future water supply. And then also I had an opportunity to go down with uh, Northern 
Colorado Water Conservancy District Board of Directors, staff, and a few other um, northern Colorado water providers uh, to the lower Colorado River um, in Arizona and meet with some of the water providers down there in the Central Arizona Project, a lot of the you know, water districts down there to kind of try to bridge um, between the upper and lower rivers. And I wanted to give a quick report on that. Um, How did you do? <laughs> well, a lot of friends down there. Let's just say we completely solved everything. <laughs> was, uh, we should be able to just click and go to the next one. Okay, um, and so I'm just going to go real quick. I think Water Board pretty much knows all this and has seen it all. But I want to let you know what we talked to council about. Um, the first thing we did was just try to ground them a little bit in everything that the water board has looked at, reviewed, and, and um, worked on over the years. Um, we first talked to them about our guiding water principles, which we've had for well over 20 years. I went through those and, and explained them. And then we explained that most of our water supply is based upon um, two really founding documents, the Raw Water Master Plan, we talked about uh, a little bit about that and what is in that plan, um, and then the Future Water Demand Analysis. That document, you may recall, is, is we updated about every five years, we update what the actual demands are, have been, we added the data in the last five years of data and use that to project uh, our future water demand. And then um, after that, we talked about the Colorado River Basin. Um, one of the things that was of interest, uh, which really I probably get asked quite a bit about it lately, is that fact that um, CSU came out there uh, with a study that said there could be up to a 30% decrease in flows on the Colorado River. That you know that hit the news media and got people talking pretty quickly. So talked about wanted to talk about that. So to ground that, we talked a little bit about um, the not only the Colorado River Compact, but also how the um, basically the federal government had operates the main stem of the Colorado River. Um, we talked a little bit about those projections. Um, a little bit about the current uh, Colorado River flow data. Um, I, I always like to point out that we have yet to be below 100% delivery of water to the lower basin. We actually, long term average is about 110, about 112% uh, of delivery. So it's hard for me to, a little, little bit of personal, it's hard for me to have somebody tell me. <laughs> Or we're being shorted when you have 110% of what you're supposed to get. So sorry about the comment there. But uh, then we talked a little bit about um, how the needs conditions and um, the upper and lower basin um, use, you know, kind of comparing um, really honestly in the last four, five, six years, the upper basin is varies between three and a half and four and a half million acre feet and seven and a half. So well below otherwise uh, could be, and then lower basin way over 10. So, you know, uh, that, that there's the discrepancy that, that we went down and talked about that, <laughs> that uh, we went. So um, just wanted to just want to then brief council on the future unknowns of our project that's really in our water demand evaluation. We call our variability uh, assumptions, everything from climate to density to future planning uh, projection. So there's quite a, quite a bit in that document that Council you know, Walker may remember. Then we um, talked a little bit about the impacts of the CVP versus Planning Gap, especially when you look at the relative priorities of those two projects. Um, and then its potential future impact on long run. One thing I always like to point out is, uh, that we go clear back to the start, the guiding water principles, long run, one third of our water supply is coming from the west slope, two thirds from the native basin, same rain. So even a 30% west slope impact 
is only a 10% impact on Longmont's water supply because it's only one third of our water supply. So that's uh, good news for us. Um, now there will be impacts on our side, but it won't be you know, anywhere near that. So that's really um, kind of wanted to let council know, and, and then um, we talked about what if options. You know, kind of summarized it with you know, if if, uh, if there is an impact so great that we didn't anticipate. Really, these are our options. Our number one option is water conservation. You know, we're close to our 10% savings, but um, to put it in perspective, I tried to look up some in perspective. I'm going to use real round numbers here about 30,000 acre feet of future demand and build out. Um, of that, the 10% savings is about 3,000 acre feet. So um, if we were to get another uh, 10 to 15 percent savings. That's 3,000 to 4,500 acre feet right there. And really, water conservation has the potential to significantly impact any any future shortage we might have. But we still have a lot of projects sitting there. The Union Reservoir pump back pipeline, especially combined with combination with the Union Reservoir enlargement, those projects really are our next kind of next in line projects if uh, when we would need them. Uh, especially the pump back pipeline because that gets us water directly right up to our system. Uh, uh, by exchange, but it gets it up to our system. And then button rock enlargement, and then we have a number of others. Try not to go into too in depth on actual projects because the real crux of that um, uh, council retreat item is to talk about where are we with Colorado River and you know, its impact. So, I feel it went really well. Council has some really great questions and really engaged in it, so we're, we're happy. Hopefully, I don't know, I'll, I'll put <laughs> Council Member right on the spot. Hopefully, uh, we got across what we needed. We did. The citizens were. Yeah, that was, that was an amicable um, and, and informative piece of the retreat. Good. We had some other interesting parts of the tree, retreat the same day. So, yeah, well, we tried to get you to see. water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Ken, uh, <clears throat> you talked about build out. How far down that list would it have to go to so, meet the build out? Or to, do we meet the build out needs somewhere um, on that list? Yeah, actually, right now we're um, water board. It, Advise Council to participate in the Windy Gap Fermi project. Uh, the Windy Gap Fermi project, plus a little bit of water conservation, should bring us to, to build out. Uh, if all the assumptions we made are <laughs> proof, you know, we did crystal the ball a little bit. Um, so we're, we're really hopeful that we don't have to go very far down this list. Um, we're obviously keeping it all um, firm. It's available. It's available. Yeah. Yeah. You said water conservation was the top option. Are the other four projects listed there in order of priority, according to maybe staff or council directly? So I'll say sort of, yes. Um, I, I, I think water conservation would be our first go-to, um, but the pipeline, we've actually, part of that is already built. Um, it can be phased. Nice thing about that project, there's four different phases. So we can build the first phase. Um, you have to go to the union enlargement before, otherwise you'll run out of water in the union. <laughs> so um, at some point, but pumpback pipeline, we could get that going pretty quickly. And its advantage is that there's a lot of water down here at the bottom end that, that um, we have available, it could be made, made available if we just get it back up into the system. The first phase is really just up to you Creek Golf Course to the Buff and Ready Ditch. That gets you, you know, you Creek Golf Course, a number of parts, three schools, and Fox Hill Golf Course um, for really a fairly short project. And that would give us a lot. So yeah, I would I would say, you know, obviously we're gonna look hard at water conservation, but that pumpback pipeline would be the first one. Uh, and then uh, it also allows us to do a number of other things, especially with return and flows. So, 
what you just said makes me understand that I never quite understood what the pump back project did. I always thought that it pumped back um, all the way to the water treatment plant so that you could make the non potable water in the reservoir potable water. Um, but it sounds like you have some interim steps where we just make the raw water more usable for things for irrigation and stuff. Is that yeah, that's exactly it's spot on. An example is right now we irrigate Fox, well, we don't, Fox Hills, irrigates Fox Hills with out of Pleasant Valley Reservoir, Terry Lake, North of Town. It's the senior, the senior water right in winter. Mm -hmm. um, and also it irrigates Ute Creek, it irrigates uh, a number of parks and three schools. You know. So you got, you got a lot of irrigation going on coming out of Pleasant Valley. We previously changed Pleasant Valley up to Butt Rock. So we can take that water in the winter into our treatment plants, but now you've got to you want to irrigate. <laughs> you got a lot of land to irrigate, so then we would use the pipeline to irrigate. So that'd be phase one. Second phase would take it up to the east side of Loma, Lake McIntosh, and then you have that water available two huge ways, the Oligarchy Ditch and all of the parks on the about the north half, mm -hmm. almost two thirds of Longma. Uh, all of that is available, but we could also move it on up to like the Highland Ditch or Rough and Ready, so we could put water in their ditch and take a like amount of water. And so that'd be the second phase. That opens up a whole bunch more water availability. The third would be to take it up to Birch Lake um, and, and get more, well, you get just a little bit more uh, capacity there. Then the fourth phase is clear the plants. Highly unlikely we'd ever take it that far. I think there's enough exchange capacity um, between here and there uh, to, to use that. Would, would you do those some of those initial steps before you would even do an enlargement? We'd do at least the first phase. Yeah, I think there's enough water. Keep, we have to keep it in and don't let Chelsea hear this <laughs> after a reservoir. Uh, it's it's going to be lower levels in the Indian Reservoir. So, um, you know, so that does have an impact on the direct recreation. Um, yeah, we would utilize more water out of Union Reservoir. But we'd also utilize what would the St. Grand Creek Pump Station Number 1, which pumps out of the St. Grand Creek just downstream of Main Street. Um, and we take exchange, we exchange water that comes out of the wastewater plant, uh, put that up there. But also, we have a lot of lower ditches after the 4th of July. We can't move up to Button Rock because they're on return flow. And that's everything from North 75th down. And so all those ditches currently, the only use we can make of them is in the St. Mary Creek. But if we could put those into that pump back pipe or the St. Mary pump station number one, that wastewater plant, pump it up to Union and pump, move it up to the parks, um, it opens up a whole other avenue for all of those water pumps. We just did change a bunch of bonus ditch water, um, Costco. <laughs> all the all the land that's irrigated under what is now Costco, um, that water is now available to us. But again, it's, it's clear down here. And it, we do use it for return flows. We do um, we do use it for exchanges. So we have and will use it. But it, it just makes uh, the availability of that use much much better. So. So yeah, that, that, that's sort of in the order, but not exactly. <laughs> and this is not going to mean anything to anybody but me probably, but do you have like kilowatt energy consumption for the planned pumps available? Um, I don't, no. Uh, I, Does somebody, if the project is partially planned, planned? I, think? Um, I would have to pull have to pull that information out. I mean, obviously, we do on the St. Bird Creek Pump Station number two because it's built, and we've been using it. Ooh. So, um, I would. I'll send you a note saying I would like to have this. Okay. <laughs> and I would be curious to hear that too. So, oh, good. Then I don't have to send a note. It can go in minutes and then <laughs> yeah, yeah. the next month. No problem. <laughs> yeah, we can. We can. Um, we can pull that information out. 
sorry, but yeah, mm -hmm. it, nice to know. Because the desirability of projects, I've always kind of twitched when I see the compact part of it. I'm like, oh, what's that energy mode? What's that energy? Yeah. yeah, but I think it would be lower treated water, which is also an energy savings too, right? Uh -huh. It would be a raw water. So there's a good energy savings there. Well, that's right. Not only that, if we consume that energy when we have that energy, then it's energy that we can curtail when we need to, giving us a better deal with the Platte River. Especially the pump station number two. Yeah, yeah. which is already there. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. Well, it, it, um, it diverts out of the creek into a, a large spent gravel pit. Mm -hmm. and so we have up to 72 hours. We can always divert into the pond. And then we can pump when we should. When we should, yes. <laughs> and oh, and that's 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 a much better way. So yeah, and that's already set up. It's easily doable. Great. So anyway, that was that was our presentation. Just wanted to uh, do that. And then um, the second half, I, I just wanted to report back real briefly on our our trip down to Arizona. Obviously, you know. Didn't solve anything, but um, for me personally, uh, um, after having done this and then come back, you know, when I, for years and what, before I went down there, I was, darn it, those lower basin people need to get their act together and, and quit using so much water because they way exceed their allocation, and I was pretty strong about that. And, um, now that I've known the tour, I still feel that. <laughs> so it did not change any, but I have a little more empathy for them. Um, I have more understanding of, of what their challenges are. It's, um, it's very difficult for the lower basin because they have developed over 100, well over 100 years on storage and they don't know what, a, God doesn't mean anything them down there because <laughs> they've always had huge storage bodies. Um, up here, prior appropriation, hey, your ditch gets called out, your ditch gets called out. Um, you know, we, it's normal for us to, to have a ditch get called out. Um, but that, that doesn't happen in the lower basin. Um, and there are, but there are some, some big challenges down there. So, um, it, 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 when I went down to this, we, we flew into Phoenix and to meet everybody, and uh, it, it turns out there. So, uh, a little, little bit more rock there than <laughs> I would like. Um, it, I don't know, the Deed Island effect's got to be interesting in Phoenix. It's, it's either asphalt, rooftop, or, or rock. So, it, it, yeah, that's, that's interesting. So, just to kind of, because what I'm going to talk about is if you don't know exactly kind of the map, um, we flew into Phoenix, we met here. Um, our first day was, so just this area, the, uh, the Gila River starts in Arizona and goes clear through, excuse me, uh, New Mexico, and goes clear through the south side of Arizona all the way through here. So you've probably heard this area around Phoenix called the Valley of the Sun, but really, literally is this big, huge valley that, was the Gila River um, years ago. And the Gila River comes down through here up past Phoenix and comes all the way down. And I say Gila River, there is no river there. <laughs> uh, uh, even, even east of Phoenix, there, there, there is no river. Um, I, I'm sure it flows at some time, so there's a rainstorm. Although um, they thanked us for bringing water to them because in the three days, a couple days before, and then one day we were there, um, they got two and a half inches of moisture, which is their average yearly precipitation. So we got an uh, entire year precipitation in the three days we were here. So the, the picture's actually probably wetter than you imagine. And this map's a little um, deceiving because for some reason they showed this whole southwest area of Arizona in green. California drop off. <laughs> There's no green there. So anyway, we went from Phoenix, went all, down, all the way down here to Yuma to look at, at the, the interesting part of, of the um, systems out there is the, the southern southeastern part, especially uh, 
where on Yuma is all pre-compact ditch water. There, there's a number of big ditches that predate the 1922 compact. The north, you know, up around Phoenix and, and up in that area, um, there's there's a lot of native water from coming out of the hills or out, you know, from Flagstaff and, and east, but but their main supply is um, Lake Havasu uh, up here and the central Arizona project. So so um, basically we were we were down here in the Yuma area, then we were up here um, on the central Arizona project and then went east into the Gila Indian Reservation to look at some of the issues there. Um, so um, our first uh, st stop was or meeting was with the Welton Mohawk Irrigation Drainage District. That um, very interesting. Um, this is the actual canal. That, again, this is pre pre uh, compact water. And the two ditches come in main ditches out around the Yuma, Arizona area. Um, the the area down there was very. It basically is the the, the bread the vegetable farm farms for all of America. I mean, they this time of year they're growing most of our lettuce and all of our other produce down there and shipping it clear into Canada to the Northeast belt, uh, United States, all over the country. So, this is, so while they need to take care of water issues down there, that also is, is our, <laughs> our lifeline, bread and butter, it's our food. So um, this is the actual canal, um, in the Welton Mohawk Canal. Um, this is a, a little bit uh, better view of it looking straight down it. And Kevin told me he, all of our ditches look this good mm -hmm. around here. Uh, <laughs> um, the interesting thing about this ditch is a lot of their ditches are lying down there, as you can imagine. Um, they need it to, for, uh, to prevent infiltration. Mm, large part of this one was not lying, and it, um, it, it wouldn't fly here in Colorado, but the, interest, the reason it's not lying is because um, the water comes out of the Colorado River and goes down the canal, but the canal is actually flowing from west to east up the valley. And so it, they, and I'll show you in a second, they, they lift the water and then it flows, and then they lift it again and it flows um, to, to move it to the east move it from the Colorado River up into the up in the valley for use. But because of that, the ditch ha the, the ditch has to go downhill, so it, it goes down. And there a lot of these places like this, it's actually lower than the Gila River. And so there actually is is water coming from the Gila River, groundwater from the Gila River going into their ditch. So they didn't line it so that they could get that water. <laughs> Like I say, that wouldn't float here in Colorado, <laughs> but it was it was interesting to me that that, that was one of the things they do. Um, very high groundwater cable. This at this point, you're at the far west end of the Gila River, where it, it comes right before it goes to the Colorado River. And their problem there is the groundwater cable is too high, and so they actually pump water out of the ground to lower the groundwater cable, so they don't have um, salt loading in their fields. But uh, the fields were amazing. So this is one of the pump stations where it, it, it reminds you a little bit of some of the pump stations you'll see on our large uh, irrigation projects. Um, those are a little bit shorter, smaller units. But what's amazing is only about a 15, 12 to 15 foot lift. It, it, they, they lift it up about 15 feet <coughs> and it goes to the next pump station. So pretty, pretty large pump station to pump that water. Um, but, uh, then it's just a broccoli field that um, they were actively harvesting. You can see um, the manual labor going on. Uh, the amazing, uh, one thing I learned about these fields <coughs> is that they, they can't have, because they're uh, produce, they can't have anything contaminating it because basically it's picked, processed, and chipped and, and people eat it. So, so they actually have uh, inspectors that go out and put little flags. 
they, they look if there's a, a, coy a coyote or any foot, any print of any animal, they, they flag that and they can't harvest the, the produce for like 10 or 15 feet around that. And so the edge of the, a lot of the fields, you, you would see the rest of the field was harvested and they weren't. But um, something is. No, they do with it. Is it but they, they, they don't they, use it for anything. They, they can't use it for anything. They just, uh, they, they have to, you know, they're, they're processing it. Most of their fields are, are farmed three times a year. So they're, they're growing it. Um, the, the entire process, I, I got lucky enough to sit, sit to one of the, by one of the farmers on, that we were growing down there. And he, he, he kind of told me a, a bunch of the stuff they do. And it, it's amazing that uh, they, he, he says, I'm not a farmer, I'm a grower, because they grow the crop, um, but once they've grown it, then they, it, they turn it over to the shipper. And, and it's not their crop anymore. They, uh, the shipper owns the crop in the field, harvest it, transports it to the processing, and, and uh, ships it to all over the country. So they really, all they do is, is farm. Um, this is one of the plants. So after we after we met with two or three different uh, irrigation groups and talked to them, on the way back we got an opportunity to tour a plant. This particular one, you can see different types of lettuce going up here. You see here in the back, the orange is carrots, where they mix it in the in there. Um, but but this plant is uh, <coughs> the products come in, it's, it's washed. These are centrifugal spinners that basically taste the moisture. You have to have, have to take the moisture to below what it was picked at, otherwise it won't uh, keep uh, to be shipped. Um, comes in here, goes up, up these conveyors, and then is, is put into um, plants. Um, just, it, it, it was amazing to me, um, this particular plant, what you're looking at right now, processes about half a million pounds of lettuce a day. And uh, there's like, he said there's like 20 of these plants in the Newman area. And they, uh, they package enough uh, uh, produce there in the Yuma area all winter long, that they send out a fully loaded semi, completely full, every 19 seconds, 24 hours. Just amazing the product that, that leaves just, just this area. So it, it, what it does is, is let you understand how important that, you know, it's not as easy as just say, hey, let's shut all this, all this down. <laughs> You know, it's it's our it, you know, it is it is ours. So then, um, then we got a chance to sit down with the Central Arizona Project folks and talk to them and see um, what they were doing. The amazing thing to me, I guess I should have known this. I didn't know this, but um, of the Arizona's um, allocation of Colorado River water. California got the biggest, about four and a half million acre feet of the uh, seven and a half million. Um, Arizona, Nevada, they didn't work out. They only got 200,000 acre feet. <laughs> but Arizona got about three, a little over three million acre feet of the seven and a half. But um, over 40, I can't remember exactly, about 45% of Arizona's allocation actually um, goes to the various Indian reservations. So the, 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 the rest of Arizona only has about 55% of their allocation to work with. Um, a lot of reasons behind that, and that I won't bore you with those details, but um, one of the areas we were able to go to was it's called Lake Pleasant. And if you think of, of it's just north of the Phoenix area, and, and this is where I did get a little jealous. The, the, the dam on this thing isn't much bigger than the Dam we're building up in Chimney Hollow right now for 100,000 acre foot res reservoir, about the same size as the dam. That's 850,000 acre feet. <laughs> so, for a very small dam, they got a really nice reservoir. I, I, I am very jealous about that. But it's essentially a um, called the equalization pond, for the Central Arizona Project. They pump um, one of the power 
because they have huge They pump from the power, pump from power, and a number of other factors. But it gets pumped into into Pleasant Lake Pleasant, which is by Phoenix, and then the rest of the system is delivered out of there. When, when they, this is the day we were there. You can see we look in the north. Basically, Phoenix is up up in the mountains here. Above, they're not Phoenix. Right. It's right. Right. Yeah. It's up in the mountains above here. You can see that they, we actually have pretty good snow back up there. Uh, shut down I-10 for like three days. <laughs> so, um, again, that was interesting. Uh, after we visited Central Arizona Park, then we went and met with the uh, Gila Indian Reservation and folks there. They're doing, uh, this is the Gila River after they got an entire year's worth of moisture. <laughs> so. Um, it, it, it kind of interesting. I wasn't aware of this. Again, fishing's not very good. <laughs> Great to learn this. Uh, they act the, the Indians actually farmed um, well before uh, even the Spaniards came into the country, and and so over the years, the irrigation in Eastern Arizona and much of New Mexico dried up the Gila River well before them, and they basically ran out of water. Mm -hmm. So they then started um, having to go on pumps, and a pretty good groundwater table there. But um, obviously, over the years, they're pulling it down. And so, a lot of the water they're using and getting uh, is going to a groundwater recharge. In fact, right here, just where we went, there's a large groundwater recharge project. So they're trying to bring the, the groundwater back up. Um, they also are, um, this is one of the canals for the, uh, on the Indian Reservation, and they are going to put um, solar over canal. And the first really one of any significance in the western United States. Um, but they are, they're just putting caissons, and then they'll put I-beams I across the canal and they'll mount it. Good and bad, it's going to be tough to do maintenance on that canal over time. But what it does is A, it doesn't take up any land, B, it, it shades the canal so you have less evaporation. Um, and they're believing more importantly than anything else, they're, um, it will keep their um, algae growth down because it won't get the sunlight in the water. So they really feel it's uh, three benefits there. Um, but this was, um, so one of the problems with the, the large amount of groundwater withdrawal in Arizona is subsidence of the land. So this sign up here is where this land was in 1969, and it subsided clear down to here, um, it, it just from 1969 to 2018. So to understand <laughs> the issues they're dealing with, um, for them, for their concern is if they take less Colorado River water, then the pumps are going to be turned on more and the subsidence is going to increase. So it's not as easy as just saying, shut it off. So this is all down to removing groundwater? From removing the groundwater, yeah. It allows this, basically, the, the water is in the pores, and by removing the water, it, it allows yeah. the pores to settle. And, and literally, it, it, it's. Uh, and there was a big article about Mexico City in April of the weekend mm -hmm. going 20 inches a year downhill. Yeah, yeah. same thing. Yeah, same thing. And, and, well, and, and, and in Florida, you, you, you give a hold of some of those limestone gardens, then they, and they uh, uh, dissolve and then they have huge sinkholes. So. And Mexico City is built on the yeah. So that was uh, that, that kind of visual. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, so that's to understand. And finally, we got a chance to go to a uh, desert uh, or, uh, garden area, and uh, I never knew there was a cactus called an octopus cactus. <laughs> but you can see how it got its name. Um, so that was really, um, really the end of it. And I was lucky enough flying out of Phoenix on the way back. We just kind of climbed up, the, not quite the altitude yet. This is uh, meteorite. Uh, crater 
um, just about 60 miles east east of Flagstaff. Um, supposedly the biggest meteorite crater in the world. I don't know if that's true. It's true or not, but it was kind of neat to see, especially with the snow. It really, really stuck out. So, anyway, that was that was our trip. I uh, it was very interesting, and, and if you're interested, I think the, the Central Arizona Project um, organization is going to come up to Colorado this summer to a reciprocal trip. Meet meet with a lot of our members up here. So. It sounds like the Indians get a pretty good chunk of water. Do they have that much agriculture that they use at all? They do. They do. They do. They're, the Gila Indian Reservation is huge, and, and they have a very, very large That's, again, on, uh, being irrigated almost exclusively with ground water wells. They're going to use the Colorado River water to, to replace that ground water pump. To balance it, you know, yeah. Well, yeah. Still yeah. But, yeah. So the other thing is, that when does this issue? How many more years do we have to wait to get a finality out of? Who's going to get what long term? Um, is that is that near term, far term? Is it? That, that's a, we don't know. There's a there's a near and far term part of it. I don't know if we'll ever solve it. But, um, That'll be interesting. The near term is two, 2026, the current operational guidelines for Colorado River for the Bureau of Reclamation expire. And we're right now, um, a lot of talk, you know, you know on between all the states, Bureau of Reclamation says we want all the states to tell us <coughs> how our next operational guidelines. Basically, they operate the Colorado River project in Mead, Powell, Two big ones, uh, as well as Wayne Gorge and uh, Blue Mesa here in Colorado. And, uh, uh, the, how they operate those systems make a big difference. Uh, I suspect um, they're going to not release quite as much to the lower basin. They they have a dual responsibility. The primary purpose of the need and foul is water supply, so they have to prioritize that, but they also generate a lot of electricity. That mm -hmm. goes and if they let them if they let them go below minimum power pool, then they shut off a lot of power generation. Especially D, which powers a lot of southern California. So and yeah, there's a short term I believe there's gonna be a an improvement in how it's managed um, short term, but the long term, you know, is still uh, nobody. I, I'm in the war. People folks in Arizona or us coming down from the upper basin could really predict that. Great. Thanks a lot, Ken. Very informative. Okay. Next item is the annual Button Rock Preserve and Forest Stewardship Update. And uh, is it Miles going to be? Well, yeah, who's, who's doing that? Yeah, Miles and Price. Uh, where do you want us to sit? Well, I'll have Miles come up here. He's going to talk. Uh, we're both. We're splitting it. We're okay, well, well, you come up there. Okay. Yeah. Unless I'll step back. Recent tour uh, of the Button Rock. It's good to see you again. My name is Price Hadley. I'm the senior watershed ranger for Longmont, and this is Miles Churchill. I'm the other full time ranger at the Button Rock. And Miles is our resident ranger up there, and he's also generous enough to come in on his day off to uh, meet with you all and share what we've been doing over the last year. Um, we always enjoy this opportunity to update you all on what's going on at the Button Rock, what we've accomplished in the past year. In terms of uh, spring water resources and protecting our forested watershed, and give you kind of a sneak peek um, at 2024. 
So we'll talk about annual trends. Um, we do a one slide recap of who we are as watershed rangers, what our mission is. Talk about how we support water resources as the two um, day to day operators of Button Rock Dam. Um, talk about the recent Button Rock management plan that you all had a, uh, a hand in vetting and reviewing over the four year public process. Um, talk about the implementation of that plan. Um, talk about some facilities projects that we completed in 2023. Talk about the scaling up of the forest stewardship program that we accomplished last year. Um, Miles put together a, a, uh, two slides of the top critters of 2023. We have some pretty fun stuff as always to share with you all. And then a sneak peek at goals um, for the next you know, calendar year and give you an opportunity to ask us any questions. So trends in 2023, I've got some stats on my phone, so I'm not texting it. I do have something to, to reference here. Um, overall, we saw a decrease in visitation relative to the past couple of years, 2018 through 2022. Um, you know, I, our, our best um, kind of hypothesis for this is that it's related to post-pandemic trends in recreation because we saw mirroring of, of kind of just decreased um, public lands recreation across multiple land systems in Colorado, including Boulder Canyon Parks and Open Space, which is our closest neighbor. We also had an unusually cool and stormy spring. I'd love to have that again, but maybe less flash flooding. That we think discouraged um, visitation, especially in May and June. Um, and then very notably, we changed our dog regulations in May um, 2023 that was uh, anecdotally and, and kind of looking at the timeline associated with a pretty steep drop off in visitation. So kind of by the numbers, um, in 2023 it was 61% slower than the heyday of the pandemic in 2020. Um, 2020 we had, you know, what I would say is unsustainable levels of visitation. We had 71,000 visitors. In 2023 we saw 28,000. Um, so Looking at our peak month of visitation is always July. Um, and in July 2020, um, you know, compared to July 2023, we saw a 64% reduction. Again, that's mirrored with other park systems throughout the uh, state. Um, annual visitation in 2023 was uh, about a third lower than 2022. And, um, we think that that was most likely related, again, to that to the rules, the regulation overhaul related to the, as part of the Button Rock Management Plan. Um, so the end result of all this really is a more sustainable level of visitation to our watershed, um, at least from our perspective as the you know, people tasked with safeguarding the natural resources up there and water resources. Um, it's lighter on our preserved infrastructure. Um, and all that said, it's also worth noting that Rangers are actually busier with enforcement related to the management plan, I'm sure, but our enforcement contacts over the last year were 75% higher than in 2022. Um, so there's a kind of a, a, a trade-off when, when you overhaul regulations. There's a, a learning period. Uh, we, you know, we took a phased approach to an educational approach to rolling out regulations changes. Um, now we've kind of advanced to stricter enforcement, uh, now that we have signage and online material and everything in place that, to help people um, to, you know, become informed of the regulations before they visit. We're still educationally spirited, but um, I just want to put in there that we are actually busier, even with fewer people, in that enforcement piece of our job. Um, other trends from the last year included scaling up of the forest stewardship program due to an infusion of large grants that I'll talk about in more detail. And catching up finally on a, a multi-year maintenance backlog to uh, more sustainably and professionally manage our built infrastructure up there and protect it from wildfire. So you compared everything to the pandemic 2020. What did your enforcement contacts look like? In 23 compared to 2020? You know, I would guess that they're still higher because in 2020, Miles was alone up there as a sole senior seasonal ranger until October when I was hired. Um, so the data would be hard to compare since we had um, 
now we, we were working on hard copy paper logs and it was literally one ranger and then police and kind of ad hoc team of natural resources staff up there so there's not as easy of a number to look at. Uh, anecdotally, having been a ranger in 2020, both in Pig County and then finishing out my year in Longmont, um, it was crazy. <laughs> so I'm sure if we had the same system in place that we have now, it would have been much higher. Um, I mean, we saw just all sorts of crazy things in 2020 across the public land systems in Colorado. Um, but kind of post pandemic, 2021, 2022, um, compared to that, we were much higher um, in 2023 in terms of context of the public about violating regulations, and it was predominantly dog related. Um, so who we are, what we do, um, we are watershed rangers. Uh, it's a team of two FTEs, Miles and myself, um, two temporary rangers that we hire. Um, this year we have a third year returning temporary ranger, and um, Dan, and we just hired a uh, second, Abigail. That we're going to be training this spring. So we are trained in first aid, uh, emergency response, firefighting, code enforcement. It's part of that resource protection and public safety mission. Uh, we patrol, you know, around the you know three thousand acres. Uh, in addition to uh, the surrounding area, um, the non-city owned certain areas surrounding Button Rock that we incidentally look after. We've responded to search and rescues, EMS calls, fires on adjacent. Forest Service property, we've responded to accidents on private land. Um, so we have this kind of fairly large no man's land between the Allen's Park and Lions that we're involved in. Um, but our primary duties are for Miles and I um, to act as operators of Button Rock Dam, making sure that it's secure, that it's safe, and that it's operating in compliance with um, our water rights. Um, resource protection, so protecting the natural resources, the wildlife habitat, wildlife values, um, and also, and you know, the watershed health. And I would put in, as part of that also the, the built infrastructure and the security of our water utility sites. Um, as rangers, which what differentiate, differentiates us from um, you know, just straight law enforcement is we have that educational ethos. So a large part of our job is public outreach and education and even when we're doing rules enforcement we're coming at it from kind of the authority of the resource um, educational perspective um, and we're involved in emergency response i'm an emt miles is a wilderness first responder we're both wildland firefighters so we respond in support of uh, boulder county sheriff's office and um, and their emergency services deputies as well as three different fire protection districts and the county's wildland fire team to help protect our watershed, our source of majority of our drinking water and the vast majority of our native water. What are your hours of operation? That's a good question. So um, we do our best to um, cover daylight hours, dawn to dusk, as best as we can stretch our hours. Um, obviously in the winter we have uh, fewer hours of daylight, so we work into the evenings and, and nights. Um, we stagger shifts, um, but we cover the preserve um, 365, seven days a week. Um, Miles and I carry pagers that the sheriff's office can use to contact us. We keep them at our homes, so we can get paged after hours. Um, so it's kind of never ending. <laughs> but we do our best to cover um, daylight and cover the peak times of visitation, um, which is pretty variable with weather. I mean, last Sunday was, you know, was the busiest uh, shift that I've had in a couple months, actually, despite the horrible wind. Um, so we, it's still a popular destination. Our parking lot is full, um, despite the rules change on a year or on impression. Um, but yeah, we do our best to cover the, um, cover the preserve for all the times that the public would be there. Um, in terms of that research protection enforcement bit, why I wear my costume every day and have the body camera on the radio and, and all the, the Batman belt, is that making, you know, that compliance piece of making sure that the public um, who visit our watershed are in compliance with Longmont Municipal Code, um, that they're compliant with state law and other things that we help to look after in coordination with the Colorado Parks and Wildlife and the Sheriff's Office. Um, we had 
over 900 enforcement contacts. Um, last year, I button around an enforcement contact is anytime that I talk to a member of the public about a rules violation, we have a way of tracking it um, uh, with mobile devices where we drop a pin, we say what it was about, and what enforcement action was taken. So we have very reliable data. Uh, additionally, now uh, at the uh, guidance of the city attorney's office, all full time staff at the Ranger program are also wearing body cameras. Um, so we have a lot of data. Um, so over 900 enforcement contacts um, <coughs> out of about 3,000 contacts for the Ranger Division overall. So we're a part of that Ranger Division that covers everything from Union through our dozens of urban parks uh, out to McCall Lake and up to Button Rock. <coughs> Overall, we average uh, only about 3% of our enforcement contacts resulting in a ticket that we're really good at educating people and getting compliance <coughs> voluntarily, which is great. So, big change from 2020. We only wrote eight parking tickets. I think there were some days where we wrote a dozen <laughs> in a shift. So, our parking issues have largely been resolved between signage and a massive decrease in motor vehicle traffic. Um, we wrote five summonses last year. I think we've uh, we've already written more than that in 2024. Um, I believe that uh, four of those were probably for dogs. One of them was for some riding a dirt bike that Miles actually caught by boat. Um, we checked 286 fishing permits and fishing licenses. Um, yes, as I was alluding to, most common violation was dogs in a prohibited area, which wasn't a rule until May 15th, 2023. We issued 135 warnings or tickets. Uh, that would probably be 131 warnings and four tickets. Um, compliance increased over time following May 2023 rule change. Um, with our nearly 300 permit checks, fishing licenses, we found very high compliance with fishing regulations. Generally speaking, our anglers are, are awesome um, and very friendly and very, um, you know, definitely uh, have that desire to do the right thing. Uh, we raised $10,500 through the Ralph Price Fishing uh, Permit Program, which controls access to the stocked waters uh, between the uh, inlet weir and the dam itself, uh, Button Rock Dam, uh, for the fishing season, May 1st through Halloween. Um, so that money goes back into management uh, and, and primarily funding temporary ranger staff. Okay. Yeah, like Price said, so we do a lot of stuff, so um, we provide a lot of assistance to the public. Um, so last year we uh, responded to 20 emergency incidents, um, 19 citizens assist, 370 naturalists and interpreted contacts that we recorded. Um, we probably quit a lot of that, uh, quite a lot of everything, great time to talk to someone, but um, 113 neighborhood resident contacts. Um, there's, what, nine private properties up there? So Kind of uh, gotta keep everybody happy, so a lot of contacts with the neighbors up there. Um, we supported uh, multiple visitor uh, volunteer projects. Um, we're, we've been working with cats a lot lately to get our trails up to cover kind of. Um, so they work on the Umbrick switchback, they do run that. Um, we worked with WRV last year, wildland restoration volunteers. Um, they did a North Shore trail reroute. They almost finished, um, and then a native seed collection, um, and then we did a what we call the trash thing up at Boulder County Beach Park. Did we do that? Uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boulder County Beach Park is up. So. Lots going on. As a picture from one of our ranger talks, um, we do a handful a year, mostly for school groups and for our conservation boards that we work with. Um, so some notable EMS calls, we had 300 EMS calls for injury or sick hikers on the CPM trail. Um, August 1st, uh, Price responded to a truck for a cyclist in town. Um, yeah. um, August 10th, there was a ATV rollover accident that we responded to in a private property. And then um, August 20th, we had a search and rescue um, on the pipeline. It was pretty far down on camera reading, so I wasn't on it. You know, a lot of people in the pipeline preserve, uh, but further down we went out. What's the helicopter doing? Is that so that's um, fires? 
No, so every year we do a um, training at the National Guard they come out. So in April they come out and get pretty much a helicopter um, okay. practice um, bucket drops for wildland fires. April they're coming to the area? Yep. Yeah, I just had a meeting with the Army National Guard um, getting some dates on the calendar. So we have an uh, MOU with the National Guard uh, and the Department of Fire Prevention um, in the state of Colorado that allows them to do this training that basically cross trains and certifies National Guard pilots as uh, aerial wildland firefighters so that the state's National Guard can be deployed on wildland fires um, in Colorado. Well, I guess nationally, but it would be primarily out to here in Colorado. If you want to come up and, and uh, watch the Blackhawks and Lakotas, uh, your taxpayer dollars pay for it. It's, it's, you can what see it right there and there? watch them. Um, they have two, a two-week window in April, so it starts about the 10th. Um, they have days kind of scattered around. Largely weather dependent. Hopefully, we'll be getting snow still in April. That could be good this far. Um, so, we also support water resource management. Um, we do the daily reservoir allocation measurements, um, put the logs online, um, daily security patrols, monthly damage safety inspections. So, the first thing we want to do is safety checks for the tunnel, camera, all that. Um, and then that's Spring, summer, fall, we do uh, raw water releases. So we go in Wes and Shara do the releases on the land too. Um, so 2024 emergency action plan for the animals prepared. Um, participate in the animal safety inspection in the state of Colorado. So we want every year do the same day damage safety inspection. Uh, and then we support electrical upgrades and run our command control house. Um, so the rules change that Price was talking about earlier, um, the management plan, um, April 2023, the plan is accepted by council. Um, May 2023, the new rules were adopted at the preserve. Um, the biggest one is the dog ban for us, pretty much. That changed a lot. Um, then we closed off the west side of the preserve. Wildlife habitat that I've got to um, redoing. Um, so, ranges and management for plan actions. We installed bilingual universal symbols and signs, so when you set that in the picture, um, you got like, what, four signs? I think that the new rules. Bunch of signs. People still don't understand what they're there everywhere. Um, we achieved high compliance with new regulations through duress enforcement. So, the first two months, we were really education based. Um, it was kind of verbal warnings and turned people around, and now we're doing spread tickets for whatever. So, I'm tracking down a little harder. Um, we installed gates and fences to protect habit habitat conservation areas. Um, so, that's on the west side. Um, we border Forest Service land, um, Colson Village Trail out there. Um, that's actually good. Um, then we enforce seasonal closures of nature out for concentration area. So it's the west side of the properties close land on March. Is the dogs, no dogs positive in your opinion? Yeah. Uh, I'm a dog person, so well, I gotta make some motions. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's still a sound, which is probably a good thing. Um, so yeah, I can yeah, I think so for like well I'm not saying yeah. So the protection. Yeah, being a dog person, I think. So, question. Your hours of operation change too. Any significant change there? Um, so, previously, before the code update, our hours of operation um, were you can walk in 24 7, but the parking lot hours um, was uh, closure from. Uh, 10 p.m. till 3 a.m., which were largely unenforceable hours. What, what we revised it to was to match nature areas throughout the city of Longmont public land system. So that the preserve closes one hour after sunset, or the parking lot closes one hour after sunset until one hour before sunrise, which we found was a good compromise as it largely encompassed the hours in which people want to be out there. Um, and we still allow 24-7 access by walk-in. Um, 
So if you want to backcountry camp in Colson Gulch during the summer and walk in, you're welcome to do that. Um, and what that allowed us to do was be good neighbors both to the U.S. Forest Service, which is open 24-7, 365, um, as well, and while at the same time being a good neighbor to uh, Boulder Creek Parks and Open Space, which has uh, multiple uh, bordering properties, most notably Hall Ranch, uh, and they have a strict sunset to sunrise uh, closure. Um, and at the same time, uh, being sensitive to our private residents um, so that they want to walk out of their house we're not getting a summons for being on the preserve after hours. Um, and we're, we feel that this change allowed us to really crack down on the behavior that was problematic, which is after hours, folks parked in the parking lot, doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, often, you know, our main concern is people building fires. Um, so that one hour after sunset is a lot easier for us to patrol. Living on the property when I lived there when, and miles living there, like going, you know, going in and out the one access, you also see what's going on on the trailhead. Um, so we're able to catch the vast majority of uh, after hours activity. Um, so this year or last year, we predicted a preserve to Ohio wildfires. So every facility up there that the city owns now has a fiber cement siding. Um, the station has a metal roof on the garage. We'll probably do that to you next because in previous trips we haven't done that yet. Um, so we also certify all buildings with Boulder County Wildlife Wildfire Partners. Um, improve defensible space and evacuation routes. So we're a lot of Laramore County Conservation Court. Okay. <laughs> Do a lot of forestry work around the facilities, and then we address um, our electrical wiring issues at the station and the, the garage and the trail there. It's at the authority. Yeah, it's the improvement. Experience. Um, so, uh, in addition to management plan and facilities projects, uh, a big part of what we did last year, especially um, my position was focused on scaling up the forest stewardship program, um, which exists to help protect our raw water watershed from wildfire. Um, the primary mechanism that we have, or tool that we have for achieving that is selective thinning um, informed by state and national best practices. Um, we logged 880 hours of staff time this year. Um, treated more acreage than we ever had in the past, um, in large part due to the fact that we were able to leverage approximately $900,000 in grant funding. Um, so we treated 209 acres and purchased forestry equipment with that money and helped offset <coughs> expenses. Um, we generated $55,000 in revenue from biomass that we um, essentially sold to Boulder County for use uh, in their biomass heat plants at the transportation and open space complex near our airport and at their jail. Um, as part of our, our uh, thinning. Um, you know, this availability of funding reflects the growing emphasis nationally and in the state of Colorado on forest health and fire prevention. Um, you know, Governor Polis, uh, as well as other, other leaders, have made available a large amount of money. Um, the vast majority of money that we benefited from last year's um, Coast Walk Grant, Colorado Strategic Wildfire Action Program Grant that we uh, one um, jointly with Boulder County, it was a million dollar grant that funded multiple projects across multiple land systems, and that was COVID um, stimulus dollars that were repurposed and, and sent out through grant dollars to address the wildfire crisis. Um, so we did a variety of scale projects. Um, we also distributed 62 cords of free firewood to the public um, behind the Nelson Flanders water treatment plant. Um, thanks to the plant operators for allowing us to do that. Um, we just hear all that within 11 days, and we have the site all in 11 days. So here's a snapshot of the, the Antelope Park project. You can see that's a mechanical treatment. Um, and then on the small scale end, you can see the block deck there from that Nelson Flanders, um, 62 cards that we distributed. Um, so we used a variety of treatment um, methods from hand felling and filing slash um, for burning to mastication, chipping, uh, and every, everything in between. We had largely um, very, very positive feedback from the public and 
very few negative interactions with visitors, even while this work was actively going on near places like Sleepy Line Trail. How did they know? Of the abundance would uh, I, would the word just get out or oh for the the way that we yeah yeah word of mouth, like foothills canyon word of mouth i mean things like pinewood springs lions some people what some guy came over from empire out because we'd go out and check their permits to make sure that they were the people who they said they were when they were getting their firewood and just periodically check and it was kind of people from all over um and as locally as directly across the street from nelson flanders yeah. too guy came over with his tractor and took a lot of wood. Um, so as part of the forest stewardship program, we were able to create 20 forestry related jobs last year um, for youth. Uh, we partnered with Lamarck County Conservation Corps, which employs uh, certified for, uh, sawyers ages 21 through 26. There's some pictures of our uh, LCCC crew at work. Um, and we partnered with Boulder County Youth Board um, and they sent us our Longmont crew, so they're all Longmont teens, ages 14 and 17. So they got a really cool source tap sense of place out of that summer work. And they did a really good job for us in really hard conditions because they work a lot of days in cold, rainy weather. Um, so Boulder County Youth Board naturalized soils, disturbed by machinery, like you saw in those photos, hand tools. They did a great job at preventing erosion and, and helping to restore the understory. Uh, LCCC salvaged 21 trees infested with Ips beetles to um, help us contain that native uh, pest, um, in addition to treating 31 acres um, for forest health and fire mitigation, uh, mostly in the area of Mullen Park and on both sides of the ranger station, and then right around the control house at Button Rock Dam the areas that they focused last year. Uh, and then rangers, we work with wildlife restoration volunteers um, to collect native seeds on site and reseed in areas that were the most disturbed. Uh, we adopted uh, a five-year intergovernmental agreement with Boulder County Sheriff's Office fire management team last year. So BCSO has its own wildland fire department. And uh, kind of the genesis of that is the county owns so much land that is then taken out of the tax pool for fire protection districts that some years ago they decided to make their own fire department to help ease that burden on local fire departments. They actually have their own um, full-time wildland fire crew, um, which is responsible for um, fire suppression, but also prescribed fire on the 100 plus thousand acres of Boulder County Parks and Open Space land, much of it um, bordering um, Butter Rock. Um, so we partnered with them in this IGA that allows them to supervise uh, specifically slash power burning at Button Rock, they developed and embedded a slash pile burn plan that was that went through a technical review with the U.S. Forest Service. Um, we secured permits from the state of Colorado, and now we're just waiting on very, very specific weather conditions to allow us to uh, safely burn some small piles out of the log jam unit, which was cut in 2021 above the inlet. Um, we also adapted a five-year IGA with Colorado State Forest Service, which is an extension of CSU. Um, that allows us to pay them a fairly nominal fee, honestly, for professional forester support. So they'll come out, help us plan projects, mark trees, consult with us on forest uh, wood products, forest tests, um, logistics, anything that we need um, from professional um, forestry services. And they do it very cheap. Um, so we really appreciate their help. They've been great supporters of us. Um, here's uh, one of the pieces of machinery, just this attachment that we were able to buy with grant funding this year that allows us to more cleanly deck and salvage wood. These are trees that were um, infested with uh, Ips pine beetles that we salvage and isolated that can be uh, milled as um, blue stain lumber for uh, open space or historical preservation or facilities projects. Um, and then this is a um, area that we reseeded, I believe that's miles right there. Uh, we reseeded a strip of about one acre with native seeds. Um, this is out on Cook Mountain. Um, so just kind of digging into the nitty gritty every year, I put in this forest stewardship program finances table. Um, and kind of, I should look at my notes, but to give you some highlights from this, we, have been very effective at leveraging grant dollars for the forest stewardship program. Since the program started in 2004, we've leveraged uh, over $1.9 million in grant funding. 
Um, we raised over nine hundred thousand dollars of that funding just in twenty twenty three alone. Again, this reflects that national and state attention given to forest issues. Um, technically, this means that we came out in the black last year um, because um, we got half of the one million dollar grant that we were jointly awarded Boulder County, um, and that paid for the Cook Mountain project. So. $500,000 of that grant funding is uh, zero match from us. Um, so uh, it looks like our uh, member who's being in is blocking the, the total for the top of that. And where I am a little bit. There we go. So you can see that we technically came out about 400 k in black last year of our forest stewardship program. Um, we didn't actually crop it, but um, point being, we were able to leverage a large amount of money. We spent about a half million and leveraged nine hundred thousand um, dollars. And next year, looking towards 2024, 2025, we've already leveraged four hundred eight thousand dollars of cash um, grants or cash value of labor that we <coughs> um, And we're excited to uh, to get into that work next year. I'm gonna leave this up for a second in case anybody has any questions about finances. And, for a stewardship program. You can see we've come a long way since uh, 2020 when we had to suspend everything from, 20, uh, from due to COVID-19. <coughs> and we would continue to scale up and, and uh, we're able to get that work done last year despite significant inflation and logistical problems related to flash flooding, having to rebuild roads multiple times throughout our project and have over a month of downtime for machinery <coughs> to do that. So I also, uh, it was a uh, success um, despite really adverse conditions. <coughs> well, it's interesting that coal is repurposing mm -hmm. money. Maybe. I think it was easier to lose it because I think the federal government yeah, was going to claw it back and yeah. the states didn't disperse it. So yeah. it seemed that caught the state of Colorado to push that money out really fast. Um, so last year, the largest project was the, uh, it's called the St. Green Forest Health Project Phase 1 which was joint project between Boulder County and the Iraq Dance, the fiscal agent, city of Longmont, <coughs> and our uh, local NRCS conservation district, Long, um, Boulder, uh, Longmont, Boulder Valley Longmont Conservation District. And it was uh, multiple project sites across public, um, so both municipal, county, land, and private, <coughs> um, three, three different grant funding sources. We were able to put them all into one RFP, and so we didn't compete against each other and get one contractor to do all the work, which was good for them and really good for us. It helped them much more cost effective and logistically uh, efficient. Um, for us here at um, City, what that looked like is treatment in orange areas. Um, so you can see adjacent treatments on West Hall and East Hall Ranch um, on Boulder County directly bordering our treatments at Antelope Park, which is the area of Sleepy Line Trail. Um, and that was a, a firm state grant um, funding project in part. Um, that same project also helped to fund the North Shore Project, which was, look, which was focused on reducing wildfire risk directly adjacent to Delta Price Reservoir. And then Cook Mountain was our large coast swap project. It was 132 acre units. So we had a 20 acre, or a 24 acre, 22 acre, and 132 acre unit. That we treated. Um, Boulder County treated, I believe, a couple hundred acres on Hall Ranch. And then you can see in this far upper right, those parcels down in the um, Eagle, Eagle Ridge neighborhood of Lyons were uh, was a public private partnership um, using a federal grant to do fire mitigation work on private land that we didn't pay into, but we um, partnered with to be able to do a joint RFP. And Boulder County was instrumental in pulling this off because they fronted all the dollars to do this and we paid them back because we do not have any money to front beyond what, we're, um, what we've allocated for each year. So the county allowed us to leverage far more grant dollars than we would have been able to touch um, on our own. So that was huge. Um, we also had a Coast Walk Workforce Development Grant that funded a project called Button Rock. Watershed Protection Project of Lionel County Conservation Corps. It was an 18 week field season. So they went back in, did a, a third entry treatment in Mullen Park, um, kind of in the area of the Ranger residence, um, complementing a planned treatment on private land to our Northwest. Um, 
Then they moved down, did some treatment off the map, right around Control House for some defensible space, right around Button RPMs uh, Control House. And then they spent the rest of the season focused on these two uh, units, kind of wings on either side of the Ranger Station, um, looking at protecting infrastructure and the reservoir from, from fire risk. Okay. Any, any questions about wildlife or about uh, forestry before you move on to wildlife? Pretty impressive amount of work. Yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was a lot of work, and we definitely couldn't have done it without the partnership with Boulder County. They basically gave us one of their senior foresters, Scott Golden, for the entire field season. Mm -hmm. uh, he was managing the whole Coast Walk project, but the vast amount of the acreage was on our property. So we basically got our own forester for the entire summer. Um, we drive up and over from Hall Ranch and UTV every day and go scout, you know, sites at four in the morning or whatever he had to do in his you know, schedule. And he was fantastic. Uh, wildlife. So this is we found a deer that had been dead for like a day or so. So we threw a camera and you know got this here online, kind of cool little twelve second video. I've never seen one in person, um, but we see a lot of tracks. This is like a quarter mile from Miles' house. Yeah, it just goes on the way. Uh, I'm glad it's in. Yeah, we got some moose, we got a little moose couple there in the middle, uh, which was kind of cool. That's the first time I caught a moose on anything. Um, a lot of bear are west. So all the bear pictures are from over by uh, Colson Gulch, Cook Mountain, which we did. It's kind of in that area. Um, but yeah, a lot of wildlife. We have a coyote couple that's been out there. Um, a lot of the pictures are from the west side of the country. I think that's kind of speaks to like anecdotally, rangers have seen more wildlife since the rule changed, uh, the dog rule changed and the visitation's gone down. I'd say definitely more like obvious wildlife signs. We had a mountain lion walk down the lower road, like the main road, below City Line Trail cutoff um, at like 11 a.m. Like two, like one ranger drove down the road, I drove up, and there were fresh, large tracks from a tom lion right on the road. Well, that's a positive. Mm -hmm. I think it's you know, just an anecdotal, but good uh, indicator that we're doing what we need to do up there. Um, sneak peek at next year, uh, as I mentioned, we have already secured three grants um, and uh, over $400,000 in value. Um, those grants include a uh, Free Adverse Colorado, um, which is a lot of dollars, um, Colorado Youth Court Association grant, which uh, will fund eight weeks of labor by the Lower County Conservation Corps on the North St. Green Watershed Protection Project, um, which is a, a treatment focused on protecting Longmont Reservoir, the most vulnerable piece of our, our raw water system up there. Um, and that has a grant of 88,000 bucks. We also got another Coast Walk Workforce Development Grant from the state of Colorado um, that will fund an additional 15 weeks by the Lower County Conservation Corps. It's a cash value of $220,000. We're going to split that between 2024 and 2025. Um, so we'll, we'll hold down to about seven weeks of that crew and, and partner with them again ne uh, next year. Um, we also recently received a um, notification of award from Boulder County's new SFMG Strategic Fire Mitigation Grant, um, which was the 1A tax initiative um, a couple, uh, two years ago. Um, so those dollars are being dispersed now. Uh, and that will fund a contract treatment. It'll fund $100,000 reimbursement after the fact uh, on it for a contract treatment on what I've called the Spill and Mold Project, which is the goal between the Button Rock Dam, Dam Crest, and the Spillway. That's had some small, kind of minor treatments, but it's a pretty accessible area year round that gives us a good opportunity to treat reasonable slopes uh, in the Longmont Reservoir watershed to help. 
limit the uh, potential for catastrophic wildfire. Um, we are hiring, actively hiring for a seasonal position, a temporary watershed forester, our forestry technician help with this work. Um, we have additional facilities improvements scheduled for this year, including demolition of a hazardous outbuilding um, that's near the range of residence, construction of a storage barn, that's a CIP project, um, to help protect a lot of this um, valuable equipment that we have up there that currently sits out in elements and is vulnerable to vandalism. Um, we have more workforce development partnerships. We're going to be partnering with the Youth Corps again, another Longmont team crew, um, and Landmark County Conservation Corps. We have more volunteer projects uh, planned with CATS, which is a volunteer trail group for Paris Sleepy Line Trail, North Shore Trail, um, a couple other areas. And we're in discussion with Boulder Climate Community on ways to partner with them to um, help improve these short trail accesses to the various climbing sites. Questions? Any, any anticipated problems? Like there are, or we're, gone. We've gone through all the public notifications. Um, so if we get weather that's within the very specific parameters of our burn plan, um, then yes. So what what that looks like is is uh, at least three inches of snow cover around small piles, six inches of snow cover around large piles, um, very light wind. Um, and cold enough temperatures for a couple days after to maintain that snow cover. Um, and unfortunately, since our since we jumped through the last year of credit coops on Valentine's Day, since then all of our storms have either been followed immediately by like 55 degree weather or followed by winds and 55 degree weather. So we're hoping that it that Mother Nature decides to make it winter again and we can get rid of some of these piles that are fields on the ground for wildfire that we'd love to have taken out of the equation. Our goal is 250 piles in the log jam area just by the inlet. They're all fairly small. Um, they Piles condense down as they age. So these piles are built six feet by six feet. Now it's in barely four feet. Um, so it's a very low complexity project for professional fire team like Boulder County Sheriff's Office. Um, so hoping that we can um, we can finish that project out and move on. And hoping for snow for all the reasons. <coughs> Tom, you got any questions? No, just uh, I'll, I'll reiterate just the impressive amount of work. So yeah, really fantastic up there. It's a special place too. So. Anybody else? knows that uh, cold snap when I was like negative 20, I took that. No. Mm -hmm. Everything just gets iced around the outlet. Well, we thank you for what you do. Yes. Thanks for letting us do what, what we do. We done by a few it. number of people, so we appreciate it. Thanks for coming on your day off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One last slide in the plan, which is in the okay. 2023 annual water board report. Um, what do you want to do with that? Are you going to give us some information now? Uh, yeah, so I've done a uh, kind of draft that you can look at um, before we, I guess, finalize it entirely, but um, much of the report is pretty much in the same format as it's been in years past. Uh, the One of the, I guess, bigger changes in the beginning of the report was uh, additions to the raw water requirement policy. Um, there was a little section that was having for the attainable housing rebate under the payment of fee for cash in lieu of non-historic water rights transfers. Um, I made updates to the water board members that have left mm -hmm. and those that came in and replaced there in the past year. Um, development activity in 2023, there were 41 acres reviewed by Water Board. Uh, water rights in the oligarchy and oligarchy extension were acquired. Um, and the only deficit that we saw cash in the paid for was springs at one month, and that was entirely fulfilled. Um, major general business kind of just goes over everything that the board took action on last year. Um, I'm kind of just speed running through this, so if you have any questions, just let me know. 
Um, uh, one of the items was the minor addition to the water board bylaws. Um, and then there's also various other additions. Uh, major issues were reviewed by water board but did not require action are also put in there. Um, and then the water supply and water shortage implementation plan, as always, is uh, revised in every year. And in 2023, uh, we decided to maintain a sustainable conservation level and not many changes as I saw. Suggestions or questions about the uh, annual report, please let me know. Questions about what we accomplished last year. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good, good report. It's a good summary, and, and it is one of the one of the items that Water Board is required to do each year is to report annually to Water City Council. So this is a nice summary yeah. document that has that and so if there are no other changes we'll uh, provide this report to city council any comments questions the only thing that i saw is that it's obviously ordinance type stuff that needs to be updated <coughs> that, you know, that there's like the director of the department title that person hasn't been here for what three years maybe now you know that's not our to do, but more of a city update that needs to deal with some of those issues. We want to approve the report. Is there a motion to approve the report? I move that we adopt it as drafted. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Come on. Yeah. All right. Very good. Um, <clears throat> last item review major project listing and items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings. Um, Cash and Lou, are we ready to go with that in April? We have all the information you need. We'll see if we do. Um, we will be prepared to come with you like we do have in April. That's the plan. Okay. Um, <clears throat> huh? Not much. Yeah, it's a shift no. from March. Yeah, it's, it's going to be April because for number, uh, there's some staff and some water board members that this is, it falls on spring break and we're not going to be available. So we're going to need to move it to April. Okay. All right. Any other questions on the uh, status report? What's going on for us? Can I just, can I get a clarification on something? Th does that, seem to suggest then that we will not have a, a water board meeting in march or do you think uh it will get changed or or what I, I, it'll uh, unless something requiring water board action comes up that we're unaware of at this point it will just be a, um no there won't be any meeting in in march okay thank you for the question marcia it be very quiet today. Everything all right it now happens here? once in a while. <laughs> it's like, always nice to have you. Okay, anybody got anything else? Very good. Any problems? All right, with that, I'll adjourn the meeting. <laughs>